In this video, we will continue covering the respawn part of the plant protect respawn cycle. We will be diving into forensics, and in order to understand forensics, let's talk about what cybercrime is. So cybercrime is the use of information technology to commit or conceal an offense. Now the range of cybercrime is drastic. It can range from, on the extreme end, homicide, to just minor copyright violations. How do we discover these types of cybercrime? Well, forensics allows us to investigate and find more information regarding each one of these types of offenses. So what is forensics? So Rodney McKimish in 1999 said, Forensics computing is the process of identifying, preserving, analyzing, and presenting digital evidence in a manner that is legally acceptable. Another definition by the Digital Forensics Research Workshop says that the use of scientifically derived and proven methods toward the preservation, collection, validation, identification, analysis, interpretation, documentation, and presentation of digital evidence derived from digital sources for the purpose of, number one, facilitating or furthering the reconstruction of events found to be criminal, or number two, helping to anticipate unauthorized actions shown to be disruptive to planned operations. So forensics has many steps, as you can see here, and we'll walk through each one of these steps in a subsequent video, but they, there is a lot involved in forensics. It's like finding a needle in a haystack, and it's getting much worse as the years go by with how much computing has spread drastically in every single realm of everything we do. So let's start by what forensics is not. It is not proactive. Forensics is going to react to specific events that have happened in order to reconstruct a series of events to maybe present in a trial for a specific case or to reconstruct events so that an organization can see what happened so that they will be able to address certain issues that occurred within their network, etc. It is not about finding the criminal. Again, it's about reconstructing a series of events. Finding a criminal might be an outcome of forensics, but that is not the end goal. It is not just for fun. The term forensic sounds very appealing, but then when you think about all the types of cybercrime that we mentioned previously, some of them are like pornography or homicide. So you're looking at images that you really don't want to, to be able to reconstruct the series of events. And so it is very tough mentally on the individuals that have to perform forensics and they have to be able to numb themselves to what they see. And it is not quick. And in fact, this is getting much more difficult as computing increases because now hard drives are no longer small. They keep getting larger and larger as each day goes by. Additionally, data is not just stored on hard drives. We have data that's stored on RAM. And how do we ensure that the RAM is not lost and so that we'll be able to pull anything off that we need there? We have data centers that host hundreds and thousands of servers for various companies. So it just gets really difficult to investigate all these different devices. So that brings us to digital evidence. So digital evidence, as it says here, is any data that is recorded or preserved on any medium in or by a computer system or other similar device that can be read or understood by a person or a computer system or other similar device. It includes a display, printout, or other data output. So as you can see here, the definition is pretty broad and it can incorporate almost anything that we interact with today. So the problem with digital evidence, it is easily altered, it can be easily damaged, and it can easily be destroyed. During the process of performing forensics, that evidence could be thrown out and no longer admissible in court, which can be a huge issue. And how do we know that it wasn't altered to hide some specific type of evidence? And so we got to be very cautious with the digital evidence to make sure that we preserve it so that it is not changed, damaged, or destroyed. What constitutes as digital evidence? So we have the electronic crime scene, and in this we have a perpetrator system, and we have a victim system. So the digital evidence is going to be any overlap between the perpetrator system and the victim system. Now it's not as easy as one device to one device because a perpetrator could impact multiple systems and so it would be the overlap between all those systems. It also might be that we don't even have access to the perpetrator system and so we have to kind of diagnose where was that overlap that took place in order to reconstruct what is our digital evidence. So there are several types of evidence that we need to consider. The first is inculpatory evidence, which kind of affirms a theory. So we're going to have a theory about what happened. And any evidence that supports this theory is called inculpatory evidence. We have exculpatory evidence, which is any evidence that is going to refute our theory. So anything that we come across that is going to say that the sequence of events did not follow a certain pattern that we had initially anticipated. 
and not necessarily a type of evidence, but any evidence of tampering. This could lead to worse consequences in that we can't use our evidence at all. And so we have to have a way to ensure that this evidence is not tampered with. So the rules that should be enforced when handling evidence are as follows. First, it must be admissible, so everything must be handled in a way that the court will be able to present this in front of a jury, and the jury will be able to use this, interpret it, and see that this does fall in line with the sequence of events. Or it, it doesn't necessarily have to be admissible in court. It needs to be admissible to an organization to show that the organization that these files haven't been tampered with, or they have, and this is the sequence of the certain events that have happened. And what we need to do with those particular situations. It must be authentic. It must be true. It must not be manipulated with to hide up certain things that did happen because it's against our case. It must have the full truth behind it. Again, we're not out to go after someone. We're out to provide a full sequence of events of what happened and reconstruct those events to be able to present things accurately. It must be complete. We must prove that we have a thorough analysis. So from when the initial interaction occurred to the last piece of evidence that happened, and we need to analyze every single piece of evidence throughout that process. It must be reliable, meaning that if I were to hand over all the information that I did and all the steps that I followed, another forensics investigator should be able to walk through the same steps and get the same evidence without having any discrepancies and it must be believable. In the matter of a court, a jury is never going to side with you if you don't have evidence that is believable. In the matter of organizations, the organizations are not going to act on the information you've given them if it's not believable. So previously we said that digital evidence is easily altered, damaged, or destroyed. So just to show you the fragile nature of digital evidence, if I were to even just hit the power button, this could modify or alter files on the system. It could even wipe some of those files or information that I'm interested in tracking. We need to be careful with that. We don't just power off devices when we retrieve them. We want to ensure that everything is handled properly to be able to retain the information that we need. There's also the ability of people to change or delete files without a trace. And this can be done through using like erasure programs where they go through and wipe all the empty space with zeros. And so that even if someone were able to gain access to their device, they wouldn't be able to restore any of the information because it's been completely wiped. If you are interested in performing forensics, there are several skills that you must have. First one is programming skills. This is obvious because you're going to be interacting with programs. A lot of programs you may have to reverse engineer to be able to find information that you're looking for. You need to have a good understanding of operating systems and applications. We're not just talking about a single operating system. We're talking about Linux and all its varying flavors. We're talking about Apple and we're talking about Windows and all the different versions of these windows and how to interact with them and get the information that you need. You need to have strong analytical skills so that you can look at certain patterns or trends in the evidence that you've seen to be able to find the evidence that you're most interested in. You need to have good administrative skills. So this is being able to use the command prompt or the terminal to be able to execute commands as we've gone through in prior videos and prior lectures. You need to have a knowledge of intruder tools. So since the beginning of this course, we've talked about the need of understanding how organizations are attacked. And this isn't so that you can perform the attacks, but that you know how to properly defend against these attacks when they do occur. You need to have a good knowledge of cryptography and steganography. This includes the ability to do cryptanalysis and steganalysis so that you can reverse any of these encryption or steganography techniques that are taking place. And being able to bypass passwords may be critical to further your steps in the forensics investigation. You need to have a good understanding of evidence handling. How do you pass evidence from one person to another? How do we ensure that our evidence isn't tampered with at all? We need to maintain a chain of custody to ensure that everything is protected throughout the entire process and so that all of our evidence is admissible. Additionally, we need to be able to be an expert witness. This means that we stand in front of either a jury or stand in front of an organization and have the confidence and the credentials to be able to testify of the steps that we went through in order to make sure that they are believable so that the organization or the jury will be able to side with us and be able to make the changes that are necessary. 
In computer forensics, there are three primary areas where they take place. First is military, second is law enforcement, and the third is the private sector or academia. There are certain laws that govern each one of these. So first of all, all three of these are going to follow certain rules or standards and guidelines as they begin their forensics practices. As they go through each one of these, there are several different areas that they need to focus on. First one is investigation, and this includes acquisition, analysis, examination, and report, which we'll go through more in a subsequent video. We need to also look at the rules of evidence and how to maintain that, and we've talked about some of the rules of evidence previously, but each type of case has different rules associated with it. For example, criminal law versus civil law are going to have different rules than one another. Criminal law, there's a couple standards here that can help guide you if you're interested in pursuing criminal law as it pertains to forensics. In civil, we have Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, Sedona and Roe, which are important to know as it relates to civil law. And then finally, we need to be able to present our forensics case. So we can either be an expert witness, which we recently touched upon. We could be a friend of court where the judge brings you in to testify of certain things. Or you can just be a technical expert. This video here walks through one of the biggest vendors of forensic software, NCASE. I encourage you to go out and watch it. So there are several dimensions of criminal and civil law. Criminal law is going to relate to the criminal statutes, whereas civil law is more of an interpretation of what your rights and duties are. The penalties for criminal law include jail time and fines, whereas civil law is mostly monetary penalties. Criminal law cases are brought by prosecutors against the defendant, whereas civil law has a plaintiff and a defendant. In criminal, the criterion for verdict is beyond reasonable doubt. There cannot be any doubt before we convict someone of a crime. Whereas civil law is the preponderance of evidence. So if we believe that 50% or more evidence is siding with one side or the other, then we will rule in favor of that side. And then in criminal law, this requires mens rea or guilty mind. This is usually in criminal law, but rarely in civil law. In other words, criminal law is going to look at whether you're guilty or innocent, whereas civil law is not. So how does it apply to IT security? Well, criminal law is used to prosecute attackers, whereas civil law is used to avoid or minimize civil trials and judgments. Okay, so there are several jurisdictions when looking at law. So jurisdiction is an area of responsibility where governments can make and enforce laws. So, for example... The Supreme Court is the major ruling court of the United States and has the final say on certain type of judgments. They handle about 100 cases a year. Then we have 13 different circuit courts, and these handle each of the cases within their own respective territories. So as you can see here, there are 11 that are listed. There's also one in Washington, D.C., and then there's the federal circuit. Then we have district courts. Some of these may be a whole state or they may be a part of a state. So for example, if you look at Oklahoma, you can see there's a western, northern, and an eastern region, whereas Utah and Nebraska only have one region for that state. And then internationally, there's a whole lot less jurisdiction there, and some things you can't prosecute because the way that a certain country holds their citizens accountable and so being able to perform forensics and narrow down where something originates doesn't necessarily mean that anyone's going to be held accountable because of the jurisdictions of international law. By clicking this info icon, it will take you to this cyber threat map where you can see where these attacks are originating from. So you can see a lot of countries that are involved are China and United States having the bulk of the attacks that are occurring. And how do you hold people accountable? All right, two primary federal cybercrime laws that you need to be familiar with are United States Code, Title 18, Part 1, Section 1030, which basically says that hacking is illegal. So getting into a system that you're not authorized to access is illegal. Additionally, any type of malware that you would be sending is against the law here. Same with denial of service. So if you engage in any of these activities, you could potentially be prosecuted under this United States Code. And then United States Code Title 18, Part 1, Section 2511 states that you cannot intercept messages in transit or even after they've been received and stored. 